Titus 1, 1 to 4, finishing with that section today. It's been about four weeks, is it? Uh, in Titus 1, 1 to 4. It's very important because it sets us up for the rest of the book. Okay? So what we've been saying all the way along is that there are themes, there are things that arise in the introduction to Titus that Paul is saying to Titus, first off, that are themes that are going to be picked up in more detail later on in the remaining couple of chapters. Okay? These are things he's going to have to be saying to Titus. And this is something he needs to be saying to Titus today. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Why does he need to be saying that? We looked at grace last time. Today I said I want the whole time to look at peace. And look what's happened this week. Oh dear. I feel slightly vulnerable. Peace. Okay, let's go back to Titus. Where is Titus today? Well, not Titus today. He's in heaven today. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's great actually, isn't it? That's kind of... That's not bad. He's in heaven. But when we were reading this, the, the today that we're reading of Titus about, where was he? Talk to me because I've got a bad voice and I'm feeling lonely. He was on Crete. Somebody's been listening. Brilliant. He was on Crete, right? And it's a, it's a dodgy situation. It's not so much the island, which is a bit rocky and barren. It's the people that live there. They're a wayward and unruly people and he's there to sort that out. Oh, happy day. And he's without a great team of supporters. When Paul goes somewhere and does the pioneer missionary bit, he's always got a team with him. But, and this is a thought I've had in the last few days, he does leave people behind. Without the apostolic team, he's done it with Timothy, he's done it with Titus, to organise things and put things in order, he's moved on and left Apollos and various people behind to sort out the ordering and the structuring. <clears throat> and no doubt, you know, he's left Titus not completely exposed. No doubt there are locals on Crete that have been converted and drawn together and they're people of goodwill, so Paul feels he can leave Titus with them. But Titus is still in a fairly exposed position himself. Do you see what I mean? He's in a fairly exposed position and what he's got to do is he's got to appoint elders. He hasn't got to elect elders. It never goes down well in Wales, this one. Appointing elders. Electing. Everybody's got to have an opinion. Everybody's got to have a vote. That's Wales, isn't it? No, you're to appoint elders because that's how old elders are done. You're to appoint elders in these independent-minded churches on that island. In all these hundred cities that are on a tiny little place that are all, you know, like, there's the chapel I go to and there's the one I don't go to, you know? All that's going on. He's having to deal with a society that also is horribly riddled with lying and deceitfulness. Proverbially so. And he is going to have a terribly tumultuous and troubled time because of what he's there to do for God. He's there to do battle with the errorists on the island. He's there to sort out this unruly lot. And he isn't going to have a peaceful time of it at all, is he? So Paul says to him, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And some of us will be saying, Oh yeah, Saki. <laughs> yeah? Of course, peace. Yeah. We might not, in that position ourselves, necessarily take it very kindly, like the person who sort of comes up to you and says, Well, you know, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. Romans 8, 28. Thank you very much indeed. You know? <laughs> but you love those people, they're a blessing, aren't they? Tight, this is in that situation this morning when grace and peace, says Paul. Thank you very much. <laughs> peace. Peace. <clears throat> Sounds a bit woolly that, doesn't it? Peace. See, I want to suggest the Christian perspective on peace is utterly unwoolly. What's that? Hairy, is it? I don't know, perhaps it is. Perhaps it is a bit hairy sometimes. Yeah, actually, that's not bad. It is a bit hairy sometimes. Christian peace is a bit hairy sometimes, around the edges. The one guy who keeps bringing, uh, well, he's got a lot, he's been building up a flock. He's Good, long-established local farmer. He's been building up a flock of what they call easy care sheep. Right? <coughs> and hair, easy care sheep are not woolly. They're hairy. And you don't have to, you don't the easy care because you don't have to shear them, you see. Because they just shed their hairs and that's it. Good, isn't it? Oh, sorry. Uh, it's, um, they've crossed a Norfolk horn. Uh, uh, no, they've crossed a... I think, is it Norfolk? No, is it? Yeah, Lincoln. They've crossed something. They've crossed, they've crossed this, oh, I know the answer to that, and they've crossed it on the Welsh. And the first, you know, the first few, and they've developed a breed that way. So it's now a stabilised breed, and they always breed true. Uh, <clears throat> they're, a lot, they're a lot of money to buy, because people think they're a great idea. 
You do need a very fast dog and good fences. Um, but, uh, but yeah. Yeah, so they're out there. Sorry about that. Uh, traumatic if you work in the wool industry, but uh, quite handy if you don't fancy shearing very much. Yeah, uh, so the opposite of woolly, hairy. Um, yeah, Christian peace can be hairy around the edges. I mean, Titus is having a hairy time of it, isn't he? He's no doubt having a hairy time on Crete, but the peace of God underlies all of that. Not a woolly idea at all. The Christian idea of peace is not woolly. And the reason you get that sort of response to the word peace is that the bulk of the visible church has moved away from the biblical idea, which actually lies at the heart of God's purpose for his people and his world. Peace lies at the heart of it. And the effect of having got away from all of that is we've lost ownership of the term peace and lost the idea in our society of what peace is about. So if you Google the word peace, what you get is that. Oh, why has that happened? There you go. What you get is things like that. The old hippie VW caravan with, you know, the peace symbol on it. The Aldermaston March PC thing with a rainbow about. You know, a dove with a twig in his mouth. Um, some funny Chinese symbol and peace man. Yeah. All that stuff happens because that's the extent to which the Christian church has retreated from peace and biblical peace and standing out for biblical peace in the world that we live in. If you go through scripture and look for peace, you get a different concept all together. Let's, let's get to grips first with what we're talking about in this context. Titus, peace man, no, not quite that. The biblical language underlying this word that Paul uses here, writing to Titus, is really quite important and is really quite rich. And, <clears throat> you know, I guess we have got the view, because we're not hippies, men, men, well, some of us are a bit, we've had our brushes with all that, but, but we tend to view peace in our culture as, you know, when you come home from work and you want to sit in the chair and have a cup of tea for a bit, is, is that fair? That's normal, isn't it? And the kids come and disrupt it, or the dog comes in and bites your leg, or something, I don't know, whatever they do. No, but she's giving it a nasty rub. Um, <laughs> so I guess we tend to view peace like that. The, the absence of anything happening around us, you know. An absence sort of definition of peace. And, and that really, perhaps, is shaped more by the ideas of Eastern religion than the Bible. An emptiness sort of peace. The Bible's got a fullness sort of peace in it. It's a full sort of peace, not an empty one. Um, in, in the Septuagint, that is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the word that Paul is using here always translates that word shalom. That word shalom. And, and that word shalom is the opposite, not so much of war as of any disturbance in the communal well-being of the nation. A busy nation, a nation at work, a nation doing what it's there to do, not doing nothing, not empty, but it's the absence of disturbance and disruption of what it should be able to be doing. It's not about the absence of activity and taking things on, it's a matter of well-being in it. So, in 2 Samuel 11:7, for example, I'm sure you were reading that just recently, when Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. This is the prelude to the Bathsheba incident. David says, how are things going with them? How are things going with them? And he's inquiring, and he uses the word shalom in the formulation that he uses to say that. So, you know, you, you go into the shop, so you go and some Welsh neighbour comes up and says, shmai, right, shmai. How is it going? And that's the sort of expression. Shmai vind, right? They even say shmai mind, right? Shmai vind. How is it going along with you? That's the sort of thing that you've got here. How are things going with you? How are things working out with you? It's an inquiry about welfare. And it's using the word shalom of people's welfare in that 2 Samuel context. He's inquiring about the welfare of Joab, the welfare of the soldiers. It gets used of bodily health and well-being. Well-being not simply in some church sense, but in the fullest sense of human well-being. Full human well-being to you, Titus. In all that grief you're having on Crete. Making sense? 
It relates to social things, it relates to contentedness, it relates to sharing the benefits of God's salvation. It's the sort of idea of peace that's found in the climax of that blessing in Numbers 6.24, you know, when it says, the Lord says to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine on you, be gracious to you, the Lord turn his face toward you, give you peace. How's God going to bless you? He's going to give you peace. And what does that look like? It's the way he keeps you. It's the way you live in the sunshine of his smile. Yeah? It's, it's that enjoyment of him being gracious to you when you don't deserve goodness. When you know his face is towards you and he's attentive to you and he's listening to you and he's on your case. That's peace. See how that's put together, that that blessing is put together carefully, isn't it? Yeah. The blessing of God is the giving of peace to you. And that giving of peace is like, he's keeping you. He's being gracious to you. His face is shining on you. You're living in his smile. And, and his face is towards you. He's listening to you. Look at me when I'm talking to you. That sort of thing, yeah? That's how you communicate, isn't it? He's communicating with you. That's what it means to live in the peace of God. To live in God's fullest roundest blessing is peace. <clears throat> There's a completeness about it. There's a completeness about it. The man who has this peace is, is fulfilled, he's complete. And Durham has written a lot, J.I. Durham has written a lot on this. He goes on to explain the term is often indicative in the Old Testament of a comprehensive kind of fulfilment, a completion, a perfection in life and spirit more than you can get for yourself because it's the gift of God. It's what God gives to his people. So after the fall of Jerusalem in 587 BC, you get all the prophets looking forward to what God is going to do to redeem his people, to solve the situation, to deal with the chaos and the crisis that's come into their lives because of their sin. You get Jeremiah, you get Isaiah speaking about this concept of peace as being that which characterizes the blessing of the age to come. This peace, it kind of it blossoms into the promise of eternal, everlasting peace that we read through Isaiah and through Jeremiah. Yeah? God's going to bring peace accompanying the end time salvation. It's linked to the coming of the Prince of Peace in Isaiah 9. You know, all that stuff we read at Christmas. Government will be on his shoulder. Prince of Peace. Now the New Testament word takes up all of that. And interestingly, there is no development of the use of the term in the New Testament. It is, interestingly, a term that is static in the way that it's used throughout the New Testament. Because it's pointing at something in the old. Yeah, you want to see what it's about? There it is. So there's, there's this complicated stuff I've written down, okay, about, uh, about how that word is, is static in the New Testament. It doesn't, the, the term doesn't go on being defined and growing. We know what that is. We know what that's about. This is what the prophets were about. This is what we learned about in the Old Testament use of the word shalom. That word always translates that word. Does that make sense? So what we've got in the New Testament is a very Old Testament sort of concept of the, the blessing, the richness of living in God's smile. Not just being able to sit down at the end of the day with a cup of tea and read the paper. There's something full and whole and significant about this. It is an established order, but an order that is established by God, closely associated with God's grace. It is the gift of God, 1 Peter 1, 2. It is God who causes peace to rule in the hearts of mankind and so reign in the Christian community, manifesting itself as the fruit of the indwelling Holy Spirit in Galatians 5. Yeah? Love, joy, peace. But, it's something in the New Testament that is also to be pursued. In the chaos, and in the crisis, and in the adversity. 2 Timothy 2.22, Hebrews 12.14. This peace, which is God's gift, is to be actively pursued. Seek peace and pursue it, right? Pursue it. Uh, we do live in a sort of a Western evangelical culture, don't we, where you know, work is to be pursued. Yeah? Uh, service uh, in the kingdom of God is to be pursued. Mm. Yes, also, peace is to be pursued in your activity. Well, there's loads to say. So much for the terms, so much for their impact. What we're pursuing here is the peace of God. Okay? 
kind of peace we get spoken of through the New Testament. Firstly, the peace of God. And that peace of God is, is peace that is in God. Got some pictures. Do you like diagrams? Diagrams. This peace that exists in God exists within him, at the heart of the God. It is, it is something that is true of him before it's true of anybody else. And he creates it in his world. It's part of the order that he's got for his world. It's part of what he wanted for his creation in the first place. Now, it doesn't arise out of the, poss the impossibility of, of lack of peace. Because you have, in the Trinity, you have got three of them. Yeah? God is, top right-hand corner, God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? Why is that going anti-clockwise? Don't know. But there it is. God is three persons. If you want to have an argument in a room, put three people in it and leave them there for a bit. Yeah? That's fair, isn't it? That's what happens. Not in the Godhead. Because God has this peace in himself. It's part of who he is. And it's part of what he creates as the creator God, creating in his image, in his likeness. And they are distinct, those three people. It's not as if they're all sort of the same and therefore they get on. Because, you know, the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. Yeah. But each of them is God. Do you see what I mean? There's tremendous potential there for, as in the, as in the uh, pantheons of all the ancient world, to have war amongst the gods. Isn't there? Almost unique. Well, yes, uniquely... The Judeo-Christian God is not like the Christian God is not like that. There's unity at the heart of the Godhead. There's this tremendous peace. They are distinct, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are equal. You know, you don't, you don't get a battle breaking out where one is superior to the rest, do you? You know, not so much. <laughs> and they're united. Peace is at the heart of God. He's a peace-loving, peace-having, peace-making, creating sort of God. The peace at the heart of the Trinity arises directly from the attribute that he possesses. He is the God of all peace. Keeps you, says the word. <clears throat> How can that be? How does that come about? Let me introduce you to a very powerful lady. Do you know who that is? That is Her Serene Highness Princess Charlene of Monaco. Hmm? What's she called? <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Her Serene Highness. Now, there are, largely, there are sort of um, Germanic prince, princedoms and princessdoms or whatever from the past, okay? And they've had a Serene Highness. Not your Highness, right? but a Serene Highness. I don't know quite where that comes in the superiority stakes. But the idea is that this person is the Sovereign and is therefore able to exert their power and their authority to the extent that anything that would trouble their peace is obliterated. Does that make sense to you? Who is it then who can be uniformly, consistently, always at peace? It is the sovereign God. Does that make sense to you? Am I making sense? I'll try to break that down and make it a bit more, you know, with a nice picture of a pretty girl on the screen. Um, but talking about serenity, this is the point at which something's gone wrong with my computer and that's my next page of notes. Cracking, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, let's call it a day then, boys. Um, okay, so here we go then. We looked at the peace of God, right? So the peace of God is the key to the rest of it. If you're going to have peace from God, the peace of God is the key to the rest of it. If you're going to have peace with God, the peace of God is the key to it, because peace is at the heart of our God, right? He is one who creates and sustains healthy, wholesome, peace filled, therefore, shalom filled relationship both within the Godhead and therefore on into his creation when he creates it because he creates consistent with his character got to allow for the fall in there bit of a snag but that's what he does the peace of God we've dealt with peace with God how does he work that out you know how he works that out I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it though I'd like to God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him he's talking about Jesus in Colossians 1 and through him to reconcile to himself all things how many things? Interesting. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now you're sick and tired of me telling you about Ephesians 1.10, yeah? That the eternal plan and purpose of God is to bring all things together again under the headship of Christ. And it looks as if I'm trying to pin something, pin an awful lot, 
all the time on Ephesians 1.10, doesn't it? To say that God's eternal plan and purpose is to bring all things together in his creation that's been broken by sin. Yeah? It's like I'm building a lot on one text. Well, here's another one. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ. So the incarnation is the key to it. And through Christ to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, all things. What God is doing is he's reconciling all things to himself with Jesus. God is not simply in Jesus trying to save people and get them to go to heaven. He is doing that. That's a very, very big part of what he's there to do. But what he's actually doing is mending a broken creation through the blood of the cross, through atonement at the cross. Having had his fullness dwell in Christ, God incarnate dies on the cross to reconcile the entirety of the, the whole catechism. Okay? It's going to be new, reconciled through the blood of the cross. Things on heaven, things in heaven, or things on earth earth and I don't understand all of that that's for another day making peace through his blood shed on the cross what God is doing with Jesus is making peace making returning shalom to the whole of his broken creation through Jesus and it comes about as human beings are brought into a situation of peace with God and the angels start singing in heaven we've got this thing going on at the moment with Christians against poverty in the UK <coughs> see <coughs> oh sorry <coughs> CAP in the UK is um, committed to trying to help people with their debts, basically, when personal debt has arisen. Okay? And it's Christian people alongside folks who are having all those struggles and you know, working their way through their debts, getting things sorted out, getting one all into one and then you know, paying it all back and short, sorting out budgets and helping people plan and all that stuff. Fantastic stuff. And they got a fire bell in their office. And every time somebody becomes a Christian, through the work of CAP they ring the bell. And there was a post on Twitter this week saying, seven times this morning I've rung the bell. You know, ringing the bell. Can you imagine those angels standing around in heaven? They don't ring a bell, they burst into song. Every time somebody becomes, because God is mending this whole broken creation. One by one by one by one. And when you pluck up your courage and you are in a situation, the opportunity arises and you say something's stumbling to try and point somebody to salvation in Christ. You have a part in the eternal plan and purpose of God, which is to bring all things together again under the headship of Christ, is to mend, reconcile all things again to himself, things on earth, all things in heaven. Don't understand that last bit. Through the blood of the cross. No wonder, <clears throat> no wonder is it that God shuts down churches that give up on prayer and give in a mission. No wonder. Because that's what he's about in this world. Bringing it together again, reconciling all things to himself by the most ridiculous looking of means. The proclamation of the gospel. Peace with God. <coughs> peace from God. Where does peace come from? Does peace come from sitting on the floor with your legs crossed going home? Does it? Now you'll alter your state of consciousness by doing that. You'll feel different because there are physiological reasons for why you will. But hang on, we said back at the beginning that shalom is something that God gives from the beginning of people's consciousness of the God of the Bible. It is a gift from God. And it is what he does as part of his whole mending in his broken world again. That's how important it is. That's, how, that's, why, it's, that's why we've given a whole week to it. It comes from God. So Paul writes to Titus, and I'm just skipping a load of stuff. Titus, my true son, in our common faith, grace and peace to you. Not by sitting on the floor cross-legged. From God. Direct. His gift. To be sought. As we learn from 1 Peter. So if it's to be sought then, finally, the word you're waiting for, how are, you, how are you to do that? How are you to live in this peace? Well, by grace, because it's grace and peace to you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's as we lean on him by faith that this is built. How do you lean on him by faith in such a way that this is built? See, uh, this is where the attack on living in the peace that comes to his people from God really kicks off its little game, okay? This is where the enemy of souls wants to separate us from all of that. 
it's rooted in the adequacy of our God. Do you believe in the adequacy of our God? Yes, of course. I believe that Jesus Christ is my all-sufficient Saviour. I believe that. Do you? Do I? Do any of us? We all agree straight away that God is utterly adequate for all of our needs. It's a truth we know. But then, well, it's events, dear boy. Events, isn't it? And events come along and things rattle us and shake us. We believe this truth intellectually. Yes, God is my all-sufficient saviour. But then things happen that don't seem to relate to that. And our ability to live, not convinced of, but rooted in the adequacy of God, gets shaken. Timothy's going to have to live rooted in the adequacy of God if he's going to deal with that bunch on Crete. What are you dealing with this week? What am I dealing with this week? Eh? We've got to live rooted in the adequacy of our God. By grace, through faith, at peace, somehow. Fighting for it some days, having to get back to it on a regular basis. I don't know what you remember about sermons from a long time ago. I've got a clear memory, perhaps... Because as a keen young Ike, I was taking notes at the IQ in 1980 from Alec Mottier. Have I told you this? I think I have. He was preaching in a short series across the student term through Exodus. Don't quite remember what the text was, but the quote was this. Christian maturity is developed as we learn to find the peace of God in any and every situation. As in any and every situation that life throws up, we meet that with faith. Lord, I trust you. Lord, you're my adequate. You're my sufficient saviour. I trust you. And our maturity in Christ grows as we consistently grow in doing that. So the bumps are what you climb on. It's cumulative, it builds. Titus is a guy who's been through a lot. We've said that on previous weeks. We've seen the battles that he's been in for the Lord over the course of his Christian life. He's been in some tough corners. Paul uses him as his man for tight corners. Why? Because Titus is a guy who has been matured. He's been strengthened by this experience, as in each of those challenging situations, he's put his trust in his God every step of the way. It's cumulative, it builds. And it builds as you put your roots down into the peace-giving adequacy of God for each and every trying situation that comes along, because they take you back to the living God, in whom you renew your trust day by day by day, as you make your way through that challenging experience. You wouldn't dream of going out in the morning without checking your car keys, would you? Would you? Oh yes, some would, okay. Um, <laughs> I should have known. I'll think of another example. Ladies, you wouldn't go out without checking your handbag, making sure you've got everything you need. Yeah? Am I, I alright? You got everything you need. Off you go. Parasite the moles, you know, blah, 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 blah. Car keys, glasses, yeah. handkerchiefs, all that stuff, right? You wouldn't dream of going out without checking it, yeah? Here we go, we get out in the morning, tumble out of bed in the car, off we go to work and we haven't checked. Who are we trusting for this? Who are we trusting for this today? See, I think, I think what it is, is you get rooted in the adequacy of God for whatever it is that has just reared its ugly head. As you turn back to this adequate God we believe in, trust him again and again, habitually, day by day, and it grows cumulatively. And as something kicks off again, Lord, okay, what are we going to do with this? You know, you've put your trust back in him quietly. It's rooted in the adequacy of God. It's rooted in God's good intentions towards you. Here again, we really do believe this, don't we? We really do believe God has good intentions towards us. We are believers in the love of God. We can quote John 3, chapter, chapter 3, verse 16. Don't we? God so loved the world, gives one only son, we believe in him, shall not perish, but have lasting life. Yeah, because we learned it when we were coming along in Christ. Not many of us in Sundays who were looking around, but there it is. It's what we would always say. But we are nonetheless rattled and stressed by the impact of events. That is natural, but we've got to deal with it. Seek peace and pursue it. So many of us Christians, we, we'd insist that God loves us, but we live lives quite unconvinced that he even likes us. We live life on a different basis to what we're believing on this. Now that, that's a shame, isn't it? it, it it's a shame, it's more than that, it's unfaithful, it's ungrateful to live your life, make your responses to the events and the interruptions that burst into your life, unrooted in the idea God means nothing but good for you. We've got to be rooted in that idea. And more than that, because he's adequate and because he's almighty, because he is a serene highness, 
is possessed of nothing but good intentions to you as his disciple, Paul is therefore able, knowing all that and having been through the mill himself, Paul is therefore able to write what he writes in Romans 8.28. But it's against that background. When he says, all things work for good to those who love the Lord, right? There's background to that. God's eternal plan and purpose lies beneath it. His experience of trusting God in each and every new situation, beatings and imprisonments and shipwrecks, and it's rooted in this. God is at work in his world supremely, bringing peace into his battered creation by grace, through faith, by the proclamation of the gospel, by the adequacy of our God, rooted in his intentions which are good towards us. Don't we see that every week when we come back together again and we've been praying about such and such, it's been giving us grief and we were able to say, look at this. I, I found recently um, my old, quickly, I found recently my, my old uh, prayer diary from when I was a keen student, in which I'd written down in my then student handwriting, which was awful, uh, even worse than now. Uh, I'd written down, you know, the things I was praying about on each day of the week, lists of things. And I could go through it and I could see where I'd put a date against that because God had been answering that one and that one and that one and that one. You know? And there were things in it that I hadn't put a date next to, but now looking back over time I can see, I, I can't remember a date, but I should have put one in there. It's a good idea, isn't it? God's eternal plan and purpose is to do this, is to create peace, is to break down the great dividing walls in humanity and make peace. His great big cosmic plan and purpose is all of that and his micro purpose as part of that is to give you and me peace day by day to deal with situations of great complexity, great difficulty. The sort of mess and chaos that Titus was dealing with on Crete Plus. Titus, grace and peace to you. The blessing of salvation, the blessing of God's purpose, his big plan. Peace to you. Let's root ourselves in that. Peace matters. Peace is important. It's not about making me feel better. It's about reconciling a broken creation to the God who saves. I had to rush the tail end, sorry. You may feel I haven't rushed it enough. <laughs> we're going to sing and then we're going to pray.